This is IAQ Radio, Indoor Air Quality Radio, the voice of the indoor air quality industry, with your host, Radio Joe Hughes, and the Z-Man, Cliff Zlotnick. And now, Radio Joe Hughes. Good day and welcome to IAQ Radio Plus. It's episode 647. We've got a great show lined up with Mr. Patrick McCarty. He's the Director of Client Solutions at First On Site Restoration. We'll be looking at some unusual and interesting restoration projects he's been a part of. Before we get started, let's thank our sponsors. They're the reason we can continue doing the show. And don't forget after the show to continue the discussion at afterthoughts.iaqradio.com. Sponsored by Our First On Site. sponsor is Instascope at instascope.co. Our association sponsors are the American Industrial Hygiene Association, AIHA.org, the American Conference of Governmental Industrial Hygienists, ACGIH.org, the Cleaning Industry Research Institute, CIRIScience.org, the Indoor Air Quality Association, IAQA.org, the Restoration Industry Association, RestorationIndustry.org, the Institute for Inspection, Cleaning, and Restoration Certification, IICRC.org, Healthy Buildings America 2021, HB 2021-America.org. Industry sponsors are AEML Laboratories, AEMLINC.com. Particles Plus, ParticlesPlus.com, Gray Wolf Sensing Solutions, GrayWolfSensing.com, TSI Inc., TSI.com, Sunbelt Rentals, SunbeltRentals.com, April Air, April AIRE.com, Healthy Indoors Magazine, HealthyIndoors.com. And now you can win a cool prize. It's time for the IAQ Radio Trivia Question. Be the first to correctly answer. Simply email your answer to czlotnick at cs.com. Or if listening live, just text your answer from your computer. And now, here's the Z-Man. Hello, everyone. Congratulations go out to Doug Conan, Aerotech Environmental in Dayton, Ohio, who was first to identify the design of coffee as the course at the University of California, Davis, which is in highest demand, attracting over 2,000 students per year. The IQ Radio Trivia question for today, December 3, 2021, has been sponsored by TSI Inc., an industry leader in the precision instrumentation for monitoring indoor air. Learn how to expand your IAQ investigations at TSI.com. Here is today's IAQ radio trivia question. Which hurricane caused the most damage to the United States? Back to you, Joe. All right. So Patrick McCarty began his field, uh, began in the field as a project manager for the National Response Team at Interstate Restoration Group back in 2004. He ran numerous large projects, both domestically and internationally, over the span of about five years before being promoted to the operations manager for the restoration division. He served in that capacity for eight years and then was promoted to the Director of Operations in 2017. Over the course of his career, he's contributed to the growth of Interstate, now first on-site restoration, and helped it to become the company it is today. He's got a bachelor's in interdisciplinary business with an emphasis in engineering technology from Tarleton State University in Texas and has 12 industry certifications. And he's also led some of the largest and most complicated projects the company has been involved with. Welcome to IAQ Radio, Patrick. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Great to have you. You've, uh, you're the kind of guy we like, you know, that started out in the field and uh, is still in the field and worked his way up. And uh, we're, we're looking forward to talking a little bit. How, how did you end up getting involved in restoration? It, it was a fluke, actually. I, when I graduated, I uh, didn't exactly know what I was going to do. Um, and it was one of those, uh, a guy that knows a guy that knows a guy. Um, <laughs> went in and uh, interviewed, uh, uh, ultimately uh, interviewing with Stacy, uh, our uh, CEO, and um, uh, struck a deal. I had, I had no clue. I actually didn't even know the industry existed, to be, uh, to be honest. And um, just uh, what I, the research I did after I got out uh, uh, of school and found out more about it, um, it, it, uh, it, it came clear to me that, hey, 
let's give this a shot, see where it takes me. Well, you went from, you know, being basically a grunt in the field, you know, and, and you've moved up now. You're the director of operations. And actually, the I think it's the client. Uh, I lost my, my place client here. Solutions. Right. Yeah, client solutions. What, what do you think um, allowed you to progress the way you did? Well, uh, initially, it was a, a lot of just dedication and uh, uh, learning. Um, I spent probably the first four or five years just, just being a, a road warrior, um, uh, floating from job to job, I mean, bouncing from job to job, um, there for about a two to three year stretch. Um, I, uh, I was on the road probably on average about 10, 11 months out of the year. Um, and I think for most of y'all that, uh, for, 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 for those that don't know, the, the mitigation side and the restoration, your average job can take anywhere from a week to two weeks, average, right? I mean, they fluctuate, but, but you know, that was just repetition of job to job and going on and, and uh, moving on to the next one for months at a time. Um, coupled with just overall communication uh, and, and um, communication with not only the client, but subcontractors and, and um, uh, back to corporate office. Um, but uh, overall road warrior dedication and just learning. I mean, I was always eager to get to the next job to learn what I didn't know uh, the, the previous jobs before. That communication's a key thing for you restoration guys. Cliff? Yeah. Um, Patrick, what does client services mean? Um, so we're trying to, it, it used to be called national, um, and, uh, the national response team, I think a lot of our competitors probably have comparable, uh, teams or what have you, um, you know, client solutions is, is, uh, the, the new name that we've given the department because that's really our mindset. Uh, it's, it's not really response. It's not really, um, um, well, we do respond, but you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's kind of a mental mindset that we want to be the solution, uh, find solutions to solve problems, uh, whatever, whatever the problem is. And let me, let me see if I understand this right. You're out of Fort Worth and then you've got offices all over the country. So when you've got a national project, a big job, um, I would assume the local people help you staff that job and you fly in. Do you have a group of people that fly in with you? We do. Um, so our, our team uh, is about 150 strong on the uh, client solution side currently. Oh. Um, and that's just the field team. Uh, that's project managers, APM supervisors, uh, what have you. Um, and then that's coupled with our, our branch operations as well. Uh, so, and I don't even know what those numbers are to be honest. But uh, we come into uh, uh, events uh, and uh, help out uh, bolster the local resources where we can. Because, um, uh, I mean, they have, you know, they know the area, they know the market, they, they know the subs, they, they know a lot of the politics of the area, whereas w us from outsiders, you know, don't have that good of experience at. Right. So, so we do a lot of uh, uh, tag teaming, if you will. Um, but likewise, um, they help us too. Uh, you know, when we go into Louisiana or somewhere that we don't have a, a, a presence, um, then um, they'll send in resources to, to, to help us. So it's, it's a very, uh, a very uh, good working relationship. Cliff, I guess you see yourself as maybe the, the guy behind the curtain or the person behind <laughs> the scenes. Uh, what are some of the things that you have to do? you know, on a daily basis, weekly basis, and, and you know, particularly uh, during, uh, you, you know, when things are geared up during hurricane season or, you know, where there are large catastrophes, does it change? Absolutely. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely behind the scenes. Uh, I'm, I'm one of many people behind the scenes, uh, behind the curtain, if you will. Um, a, a lot of our effort is spent to supporting our field teams because, I mean, let's face it, they're the ones that get it done. I mean, uh, so from, from logistics, warehouse, uh, procurement, uh, HR, financial, uh, uh, backhouse operations, I mean, it's all geared in an event to support the field team and make sure that they're getting what they need to do their job. Um, as far as what I do, uh, uh, you know, it, in an event, I'm doing a lot of uh, 
I guess, traffic control, if you will, <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, getting the different parties uh, paired up with the different uh, uh, needs required out there in the field and um, uh, troubleshooting uh, and just overall just trying to coordinate the efforts to make sure that we deliver a, a quality product. It was a, is, I, guess ahead, a, I guess it's a follow-up, you know, you said troubleshooting, like uh, what sort of, can you give us an example of something that you had a troubleshoot? Oh, well, a lot of it is logistics, uh, right? Initial onset of just getting equipment, material, and personnel mm -hmm. there. Um, you know, the field team is great about once they get uh, uh, what they need, um, then, then they're great about getting it done and, and knowing what to do. But there's always hurdles going into any major event, uh, not only domestically here in the U.S., but especially international, right? Um, and um, hotels, lodging, right? Um, freight issues, uh, road closures, um, and then going into just your normal day-to-day -day, uh, issues like uh, having generators uh, dropped and then you go to fire them up and they're, they're, it either had bad diesel or or something else and having to do a, a call in an audible and switching out uh, equipment, um, uh, you know, labor delays, right? I mean, there, there's always, there's always issues out there to, to be, uh, to be fixed or uh, uh, worked on. Now, speaking of labor, we're hearing a lot about how difficult it is to get people and employees and, and new hires and so on. Uh, what's your, your experience been in that respect? I, I, I agree. It is definitely a, a, a changed environment. Um, I, I, I actually want to say it's actually getting a little bit better uh, over the last couple of months. I've been seeing an incline. It's not as, as grueling. Uh, but uh, last year was tough for sure with uh, COVID and then um, uh, all of the other issues that, that uh, you know, our country faced. Um, it was definitely difficult, uh, not only in-house personnel, um, but, um, you know, third, uh, our subcontractors too, right? I mean, everybody thinks it's just us, but we're only as good as our sub, subcontractors too, right? And, um, you know, when they struggle, we struggle. Hmm. So um, it, it's across the board. It's been an issue. Cliff? Yeah. Um, I have some philosophical questions, I guess, for you. You know, you were talking about project managers and, you know, you, you guys have a lot of them. In order to manage or oversee a large project, do you think that um, an overseer like yourself first needs to know how to run a large project, you know, before he can supervise others? Or do you think that suit that running the project is different from oversight no i, I think there's always a uh, benefit in having a base of knowledge of, of what the field is facing i mean it's hard um and i really have to boil it down to what is that responsibility going to be if you're just going to be a financial guy and looking at numbers then uh, probably not so much but uh if you're managing the overall process and having a base a foundation uh, of of what it's like out there and what you need is, is in, invaluable, um, uh, not only to relate with the field, but to, you know, articulate that to, to others who aren't, aren't familiar with it. Um, and when you're troubleshooting uh, uh, certain items, there's that, there's that experience that, uh, you know, it, it pays dividends for sure. Um, you know, even, even down on the project manager level, you know, when you're when you're dealing with smaller jobs, and I understand small is relative uh, uh, to 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 your business, but um, you know, 20, 50, uh, 100, 200 thousand dollar jobs, um, the project manager uh, in itself, and I'm pushing it down some, um, can 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 do what's required. They can do they can work with the client, they can work with the adjusters, consultants, and and run the job as well. But when you start talking about larger projects, $5 million, $10 million, uh, uh, million dollar jobs, even on the job site, the project manager isn't really running the job. I mean, and, I, and I'm, you know, to put that in perspective, they're obviously running the job, but they're relying on their team to actually get the work done and, and, and coordinate because the PM tip typically is tied up with in meetings and coordinating scheduling with adjusters, consultants, clerks, clients, internal uh, personnel so that so they get bogged down uh, 
pretty heavily on doing admin project management work and rather than coordination of the of the worker bees, if you will. Curious, but when you're looking for people, are there certain groups of people that seem to work out better for you? Maybe military or, or women or um, you know, people that have construction background, or is this something that uh, is there something else that you look for? There's all kinds of needs out there. I mean, uh, military obviously is, is a benefit because they, they kind of know the drill already of, of uh, when the bell rings, they're off and running, travel, don't know when you're coming back. Um, uh, ladies, uh, highly skilled at detail work, right? Cleaning, uh, paperwork, uh, and, and I'm generalizing, right? Uh, I don't want to box any anybody in, but, uh, you know, that's, that's kind of the generalization that, that, that they do well at. Um, so, uh, construction background, mitigation background, I mean, we, we look for it all because at any given day, we're going to come across, uh, a need for that characteristic or that quality. Um, and the, the, there's one core quality that I personally do look for, uh, or a couple, uh, I should say is, um, uh, dedication and willingness to, to, to put in the time and effort because it's, it's a sacrifice. Uh, you've, you've got to put in the time and, and, and effort. And if you're looking to just punch a clock, it's going to be a, a, a rough road. But uh, time, effort, dedication, and, uh, and integrity, to be honest. Uh, the rest of the stuff we can, we can teach and train and you can acquire over, over, over time. Cliff? Yeah. Um, I guess uh, let's talk maybe a little bit about like formal work practices and, and, and that sort of thing. Because I, I suspect it changes, you know, uh, the, uh, on a hundred thousand dollar project that you know that you do all the time. It's uh, drying, it's extraction. You, know, you kind of have your normal work process that that you do, and then sometimes uh, on these larger projects, uh, you know, they're strange, they're unusual, they're one of a kind. Uh, how do you handle that? Well, we, we have our playbook, right? And I mean, I think everybody does. I mean, regardless of any industry or business, you have your playbook. Um, and, and, and we have our best practices for project managers, best practices for supervisors. And, and for the most part, we do follow those. Um, but as, as Cliff, you're kind of uh, mentioned, and, and uh, we spoke briefly yesterday, uh, it's, there's environments where you got to call audibles. I mean, you go into a hurricane where the where, where disaster area and you don't have power, you don't have what have you. Uh, you know, you may not be able to charge your laptop battery. Um, so so uh, uh, or your phone. So so, uh, so technology is it really comes into play, and you have to have the audibles and the processes to work around your your playbook, if you will, um, to to get around that. So. Yes, we do have our playbook, but is it 100% followed? Not always, no, sir. You know, yesterday when we were talking, uh, just as a follow-up, uh, you said something that the right answer is not always the right answer. Uh, you know, sometimes, you know, you need to figure it out. So could you comment on that? Uh, definitely, and, and it really comes into play uh, uh, when you're working a remote and um, uh, international areas where you you know, there's not a Home Depot next door, uh, right? Uh, or Lowe's or, or, or Ace Hardware or something like that. It's, um, you know, sometimes you got to use the tools you have and, and figure it out. And uh, Cliff, I think you even mentioned it, you know, uh, you know, if, if the scope of work calls for a D4 uh, dozer um, and, and it's going to cost 100000 to get there or, or, or three or four days to uh uh, delivered or what have you, and, and you've got a workforce behind you with uh, machetes or shovels and get after it. I mean, yeah, I mean, the dozer may be the best answer, but you don't always have that option. Um, uh, you know, scissor lift, uh, right? I mean, uh, you, you reach in high places, uh, you might need uh, a, a scissor lift or a forklift and um, to get something done. But if you don't have those tools handy, Sometimes you got to think uh, outside the box and 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 accomplish the overall goal. I think that's ultimately what kind of rooted me into the business was because it was always ever changing. You're always trying to problem solve and figure stuff out how to figure out how to get stuff done. Um, 
you know, safety is always a priority. I'm not going to rule that out. I mean, you got to stay safe and, and work smart. Uh, but uh, at the end of the day, sometimes you just got to roll up your sleeve and, 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 and figure it out. Uh, early in your career, you, you were on a fire damage in the Pacific Ocean. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about what that was. That's That's got to be an interesting one as far as logistics go. It, it was, and, and uh, it was actually my first job ever in the industry, not only with the uh -huh. company, but in this industry. <laughs> uh, and um, they told me what was going on, and I, I was like, okay, uh, let's go. Um, so we flew into Mexico, uh, and then... Um, uh, took about, it was about a six hour boat ride out to this oil platform. Wow. Um, and, uh, what were, and they had a, uh, they had a fire in their, uh, command control center. And, uh, for those of y'all who don't know, an oil platform is basically just a big, uh, um, boat. Uh, and that's really all is in the propellers, uh, keep it stationary. Um, but it sits about a hundred foot off the water, uh, the, the platform and they have a big crane on there. And um, so, you know, my first job out of the gates, I'm, you know, <laughs> puttering up to this big oil rig uh, in, in a boat and, and they drop down the crane uh, and, and it's got netting that you basically, with a platform that you basically step on the platform, you hold on to the netting and they, you know, we, you know haul you up to the platform. Um, and uh, that was kind of my opening. At that point, I was like, okay, what did I get myself into? <laughs> <laughs> but, um, uh, we were there for about 10 days. Uh, it was a, a structure and electronics cleaning, uh, you know, the command control center, the, the motherboards and the control switches and panels. We had to get a, a bunch of soot and clean out the soot and clean it up, get it functional. They were working on a backup uh, system at the time uh, that was keeping everything stationary. Uh, but we were there working 18, 20, day, uh, 20 hour days. Um, and that's, that's, that's all we did was just sit there and clean soot in the, in the room. It was only a, a crew of about um, eight to 10 people as I recall, because it wasn't a very, you know, it's, it's not a very big room. And they're, they're very nautical in the fact that, you know, the, the boats are big, but the quarters and rooms are small, right? Uh, so, um, you know, bringing in 100, 200 people wouldn't have, wouldn't have done any good. I mean, you couldn't have, you couldn't have fit them in the room, but uh, 10 days, lots of hours and, um, and uh, we accomplished it, but it was it was it was an eye opener for a first time. Cliff? On on a project like that, you know, just as a follow up, on a project like that, would you send an estimating team or someone out there first to figure out exactly, you know, what you're going to need, or do you just pack what you think you might need and go? Oh, yeah, I mean, there's no way on, on something like that, you've got to get a uh, checklist uh, and, and get all your materials and supplies up front because, uh, I mean, there's no, uh, it's not easy to get a, a, a restock or reshipment. So you've got to, um, you got to go prepared. And, and I think it was about two weeks before the job, our estimating team flew out there, sized it up, got, they went through the checklist. And I remember we spent about uh, before we left, we sent, spent like two or three days just going through everything. Okay, what if this? What if that? Uh, because we didn't have an opportunity uh, uh, to really go get bulk items of, uh, of resupplies. Um, so, so, yeah, there's definitely plenty of time spent on the front end and, and doing research, uh, 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 making sure that we had the checklist ready to go. You know, even though you only had eight to 10 people on that project, where do they sleep? Um, is there, you know, there's already a crew there, I assume, unless they had to be right. evacuated. And that's another reason why we had to keep the numbers slow because, yeah, there's only a number, a certain number of beds uh, uh, available. Um, and they, uh, so we had, we had two quarters. So there, I guess there was eight, I guess there was eight of us. We had two quarters and there were four beds stacked up. Uh, like you would see in a, a, a naval vessel, if you will, uh, bunk beds. Um, and uh, yeah, we just, we, we, we spent most of the time in the, in the uh, command control room, uh, to be honest. I, don't, I, don't, I actually don't remember the room all that well because I don't remember <laughs> spending much time in it. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, the food was great. It was, I was actually surprised by the food. The food was amazing. Um, and, um, but it was a, uh, it was definitely, a, it was a great experience. Cliff? Yeah, Joe. Um, 
let's see. What I was thinking is, why don't we go to halftime now, then come back? And, um, you know, what I'd like to do is, uh, you know, he has a chart that kind of talks about how a project goes, and maybe we'll talk about that job and that project after halftime. What do you think? Sounds good. Let's go to halftime, John. Thank our sponsors. We'll be back in about two minutes with our guest, Patrick McCarty. Thank you. Our marquee sponsor, Instascope. More jobs done faster with the future of IAQ assessment technology. Unlimited samples, instant results, and cloud-based data at instascope.co. Our association sponsors are AIHA, Healthy Workplaces, A Healthier World, AIHA.org, ACGIH, Advancing Careers of Professionals in Environmental Health, Industrial Hygiene, and Safety, Interested in Defining Their Science, ACGIH.org, The Cleaning Industry Research Institute, See More Deeply Through Science and Research, CIRI Science. Dot org. The Indoor Air Quality Association, IAQA.org. The Restoration Industry Association, the granddaddy of the restoration industry, restorationindustry.org. The IICRC, a nonprofit standards development and certifying body for the cleaning and restoration industry, IICRC.org. Healthy Buildings America, Honolulu, Hawaii, January 18 through 20. 2022, hb2021-america.org. Industry sponsors are AEML Laboratories, free shipping, great pricing, same-day results with no rush fee, AEMLINC.com. Particles Plus, feature-rich particle counters and air quality instrumentation, count on us, particlesplus.com. Gray Wolf Sensing Solutions, over 20 years manufacturing accurate, reliable IAQ instrumentation for portable, short-term, and continuous monitoring. GrayWolfSensing.com. TSI Inc., an industry leader in precision instrumentation for monitoring indoor air. Learn how to expand your IAQ investigations. TSI.com. Sunbelt Rentals. Availability, reliability, and ease. For all your IAQ and restoration needs at sunbeltrentals.com. April Air, healthy air, healthy home, April, A-I-R-E dot com. And Healthy Indoors Magazine, a free online magazine for industry professionals and consumers, healthyindoors.com. All right, we're back for the second half of our interview. Cliff, you want to take it? Yeah, John, uh, can you put up our chart? John, that, that flow chart. I'm going to have Patrick kind of take us through it because I think not everyone realizes what's involved in one of these projects in terms of the, you know, he's talked about the planning and the execution and, and so on and so forth. So if, uh, yeah. okay. So what they're bringing up is a, a, a project that we did uh, uh, many years ago, uh, but it was, um, there's a lot of moving parts to it. So any, any project's going to be tailored, uh, any structure hierarchy, if you will, is going to be tailored to, to that project need. Uh, but, but in this instance, this is, this is the, uh, this is the uh, flow chart that we use for this project. And um, the client had a uh, environmental exposure uh, that uh, was, was below the limit threshold to, to become a, a, a noticeable or, or something that we had to get a, a permits and licenses for. But the, the client wanted to alleviate some liability. And, and, um, and so we implemented, came in, implemented this process flow. Uh, and we did about 2.3 million boxes. Uh, it was actually almost 2.4 million boxes that we had to come in, uh, HEPAVAC wiped down. Wipe down um, and uh, this, this spanned about four months. So what we in, went in with was, um, we had the, the, the extraction team, we had the racking as a warehouse with a, just a bunch of racking uh, and, and their own version of their own Dewey Decimal System. Uh, and so we had teams go in, the extraction team, they, they pulled the boxes out, got them on the conveyor uh, roller system, went in. Uh, uh, we did the remediation, the cleaning, if you will. Um, and then the uh, uh, 
carton team ended up um, putting them back in the uh, in the new clean area, if you will. All this at the same time, the, the company still had to be in, in operation. So we had picking crews uh, that, you know, when the client, you know, when their client called them, said, hey, I need this box, uh, you know, by Friday this afternoon at 4 p.m., right? Um, so uh, we had the, uh, the SWAT team, the picking crew, whatever you want to call them, go in, find the box, come out, clean it, HEPA vac it, and then uh, uh, turn it turn it over to the uh to the customer. Um, you know, we didn't come out of the gates like this. Uh, you know, I think I think we at one point we got to 250, 300 people. Uh, you know, we we ramped up, we worked out the kinks and worked out the flow, make sure that in theory, you know, it's always one thing to have something in theory versus something <laughs> uh, you know applied. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, so we we I think we started out with like 75 people. Uh, uh, fine tune the process, workload, everything, and then and then ramped up to about 300. Ran for about four months, and obviously, as our scope confined, then then we tapered back down uh, 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 just to phase it out. But there's a lot of moving pieces, a lot of moving parts, and as I as I was talking earlier, sometimes the project manager isn't they're not always walking the line, uh, uh, the you know the, in the trenches. Um, they're, they're communicating back and forth with their supervisors, their team leads. Um, and this is definitely one of those projects where you've got to have a team, uh, you know, knowing their business, knowing what they're doing, knowing what their objective is and, and executing. Um, so lots of teams, lots of supervisors and lots of moving parts. What was the cause of the loss? Uh, forklift hit a column. Um, uh, and, uh, then they were doing some roof repairs after, and then, uh, it was, a uh, uh, lead exposure, lead dust exposure. Lead dust. Where, well, where, where was the lead dust from? Uh, something up there in the, something up there in the, uh, ceiling structure. Up in the ceiling. And okay. Interesting. Did you have someone there doing testing on the lead? We did. Uh, we did, and that's why I said it. Everything uh, fell below uh, all the PEL. Reportable, I mean, right? It was. It yeah. was mainly just. It was mainly just uh, uh, risk mitigation on their side. That's a big project. Two point three million documents uh, or boxes, 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 boxes of boxes. Boxes itself. Wow. Um, oh, over a four geez. over a four month span, and it was just it was just like an assembly line, just one after the other, and you know, in one door, out the other. Wow. Um, and, um, it, it, there was a lot of team effort, a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of support that went into that project because that four month time frame uh, that it happened, this was non hurricane related, uh, uh, but the four month time frame coupled overlapped during hurricane season. So we were doing this in conjunction with, with, uh, uh, all our other work, uh, across the country. Hmm. So. Cliff? Yeah, I guess just the follow up to that, and then, then we can move on. Does uh, first on site have technical teams, uh, you know, either in the United States or Canada, or combined team, you know, where you have a safety person, you know, an electronics expert, uh, you know, maybe a uh, conservator for fine arts, and, and and so on and so forth. Do you have like uh, a, a team that you use in house, or do you utilize uh, outside contractors for that? Uh, we, we have uh, relationships uh, throughout the country, uh, uh, and it depends It depends on what the field is, engineers, uh, electronics, uh, what have you. We do have in-house experts as well mm -hmm. around uh, mold, HVAC. Uh, uh, a recent acquisition was uh, contents. Uh, we, we had contents and uh, document drying out of St. Louis and here in Fort Worth. We do that in-house, and then uh, down in the Panhandle of Florida, contents. So, so we, we do have some specialities uh, uh, internal um, and, and we're growing. Uh, uh, we do wanna be the, uh, the experts out there. So, um, but we also have external subcontracted resources as well. Okay. Let's move over to this project that you were doing uh, for the government in, in New Jersey. Um, uh, you know, you know, we spoke about it yesterday, you know, what, what type of project was it? Uh, you know, what type of building was it? You know, like what caused the loss? You know, what was the scope? Uh, you know, unique challenges? 
uh, so on and so forth. Sure. So it was, a, it was flooding, uh, uh, flash flooding, and um, there there are a lot of challenges that we we were blocked out. Road, uh, you know, roads were washed out, what have you. So we couldn't get there uh, for for probably about. 24 hours. Um, so we're already behind the eight ball uh, in response and, and water damage, obviously, uh, you know, time, time, <laughs> time matters. Um, so uh, the first at the onset was just getting there, um, setting up deskants. It was a large facility, very large facility. I think we ended up running about 150,000 CFN deskant. Um, and um, there was security, uh, lots of security around. So I remember the initial onset, we were just trying to get the desk and run. And I, I, was, I was up for like 36 hours straight, just trying to get this thing up and running. And I remember I was trying to um, hardwire the, uh, uh, get the cable hooked up from the desk to the, to the generators. And at some point my vision, I was so tired, I, I just lost color. I couldn't see color anymore. So I, I had the cable phased out, I had all red, yellow, green, you know, white, you know, ready to go. And uh, I, it was all gray to me. I couldn't see it. So um, at that point, I knew I was like, okay, time out. <laughs> uh, I got some somebody over there helped walk them through the process, and then uh, I went. I went to the hotel, caught a you know, got about an hour, two hour nap, and then and then back at it. But you know, tr just trying to get the initial setup of a very large facility, uh, you know, when you're already behind the eight ball, uh, uh, is, is is daunting in itself. Um, Coupled with there, there was a there was a conference room in particular, and I and I'll remember this forever too because it was it, I was I was a little surprised, uh, but we had to be escorted in uh, under uh, uh, armed guard because uh, it, it was a room that I guess they have top secret classified conversations in, but they were highly paranoid about bugs and wires and security of the room. Um, but in, in doing my investigation, I, uh, I come to find out that. Uh, uh, again with lead, um, the uh, the walls were lead plated mm -hmm. and had a, a, it was like a chicken wire, electronic uh, chicken wire lining on it, um, uh, just just all for the security and uh, secrecy of that room. And mm -hmm. so, uh, you know, they had about three foot of water come through there and, and we're trying to, uh, trying to dry out that room and, you know, we couldn't core holes, we couldn't, uh, I mean, we couldn't, we couldn't do anything. So we ended up just baking it in place, uh, you know, tinning, uh, you know, running plastic and, 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 and confining our, our uh, dry zone. But um, it was, it was, it, it was a, a project to remember for sure. Were there, did your people have to go through security clearance or were they just escorted? Uh, we were escorted in teams. Um, a lot of our lead personnel uh, uh, were already cleared, um, but that room particular, uh, in, in particular, uh, uh, cleared or not, uh, it, we were escorted. <laughs> so but, uh, there's definitely security clearance issues uh, that we have to go through as well. It might have been like one of those Faraday cage things where, you know, nothing gets in, nothing gets out transmission-wise, I guess. I, I, I think that is what it was, Cliff. Mm -hmm. yep. Okay. Um, you know, not all these projects are, um, are alike. And, you know, I, I think over the course uh, you know, in my career in restoration and, uh, you know, Joe's career in indoor air quality, you know, we've been involved with some claims where, um, you know, they were, you know, something gut-wrenching happened. And uh, I'm wondering if you could tell our audience about, you know, your personal most gut-wrenching uh, project. Sure. Um, well, there's a, you know, I, I think another reason what looped me into this industry and sucked me in was, we see, we see a lot of stuff uh, that, that most people don't see. I mean, we're going into disaster areas. We're seeing what uh, well, uh, the full force of what Mother Nature can do. And it um, makes you appreciate what you have. Uh, so, so there's a lot of humbling experiences uh, over the course of my career that I've come across. Um, but uh, pro probably one that sticks out the most in my mind was... Um, uh, in Enterprise, Alabama, 
uh, back in 2007. They had a uh, they had a tornado uh, go through there, and Enterprise kind of sits in a bowl, if you will. And the and the and the tornado ended up doing a few figure eights in that bowl uh, mm-hmm. before it moved out. Um, and uh, we did the school system there. And uh, unfortunately, there were some uh, students, you know, the sirens alarm, they did what they were supposed to do. They went in the hallway, you know, covered, uh, uh, covered their heads and all that, but uh, ended up knocking down one of the walls onto a, a, a group of kids that were uh, staying there and, and, and uh, they passed uh, and they did not survive. So, I mean, there's a lot of emotion in that community already. Uh, just from that happening and then losing their personal effects and houses and, and, and everything. And um, uh, just trying to manage, you know, trying to be the solution uh, in that environment and, and come in and, and, and let everybody know that it's going to be okay. Uh, well, it was definitely a tough environment. Um, I, I, yeah, I mean, I, that, that one sticks out in my mind. Uh, and, and I'll remember that one forever. Hmm. So you were there to dry out the building and, and clean up the damage? Clean up the debris, uh, a, a lot of cleanup. Uh, the library uh, got uh, affected, so we were doing pack out and inventory on the library. Uh, grounds clean up, debris clean up, drying, um, uh, just just total total mitigation and restoration, yes, sir. Cliff? Okay, um, let's see. Um, there's, there's one photo I saw that John that, that Pat sent us. It looked like a, a board went through a, a, a tree, um, yep. a palm tree. Where's that at? Uh, that's actually in Puerto Rico. Um, after uh, uh, I think it was Irma, uh, went through. Wow, it's a, it's, it's a two by six, um, and it literally impaled uh, through the palm tree there. Um, and I've saved that picture on my phone uh, 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 ever since that. But, uh, you know, just overall debris and ground clean up. There's a picture of that board again. Mm. Um, and you can, uh, I mean, just the, the sheer force that it took uh, <laughs> I mean, to do something like that. I mean, you see stuff like that. It's just, it just never ceases to amaze me uh, what, what, mother, what Mother Nature can do. Wow. And this was, uh, when was this again? Uh, I'm fairly certain that was Irma. Irma. And what were you? What kind of building were you cleaning up there? Uh, resort, uh, uh, high end resort. Uh, went out there to uh, to do the restoration mitigation. Um, you know, and it was on the other i. It was on the other side uh, of the island. So there was a bunch of um, uh, road issues, uh, as you can imagine, um, and. And when you, when you get into the island work uh, and international, there, there's there's a whole nother level of, of hurdles that you have to overcome. And it, um, uh, one of the islands out there, is, uh, the, the port was actually uh, uh, not operable and they, uh, they were taking several weeks to have to get the, the, uh, the port fixed and up, up and running. So, so we were prepared uh, to uh, uh, have a barge, uh, a, a landing, a beach landing unit, if you will. We took our materials, supplies, and, and prepared to have it sent and, and actually just uh, offload it right there on the beach of the resort. Hmm. Um, you know, we rented DC-10s um, uh, going into Mexico uh, and loaded them with uh, 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 equipment and material supplies and, and flown them in. Um, uh, tractor trailers, uh, you know, crossing, you know, the peninsula there uh, on the west coast uh, going into Cabo is not always safe. Uh, uh, tractor trailers and, and, and rigs have been known to disappear. Uh, so uh, we, we flew this, we, we flew everything straight into uh, uh, Mexico, which, you know, that comes with its own set of hurdles, right? Because uh, it, uh, yeah. You got to require, uh, you know, bill of lading. Uh, um, you have to have a customs broker on the other end. Um, uh, plastic pallets, no wood pallets. Uh, you know, in Mexico specifically, uh, nothing from China. Uh, <laughs> uh, which, you know, if you think about all the components on our uh, DHUs, refrigerants, you know, some level of it uh, uh, comes from China, I guarantee it. 
Uh, but, uh, you know, there's a lot of angles and, and uh, uh, hurdles that have to be, uh, that have to uh, be worked around. Why, what, why plastic pallets? I'm, I'm confused on that. Again, insects, it, it, insects. Uh, oh, okay. uh, wood beetles and, and, and what have you. Uh, certain countries are worried about that. But uh, even beyond that, uh, just the airlines. Uh, they don't want splinters and, you know, y'all know, I mean, wood pallets, you know, some, somebody hits it with a pallet jack and the wood splinters and, you know, they don't want those in their planes because uh, uh, it, it'll gum up their gear and their, their uh, track system. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's got to be, you know, uh, size, measured, weighed. I mean, there, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of stuff that goes into, the, uh, and, into operations such as that. Um, and you've got to get it done <laughs> quick too. You can't, you know, you, how do you cut through the red tape? Is there any tips or secrets to cutting through the red tape? I mean, knowing the light or right contacts, but a, a lot of that comes down as working with your client and customer uh, again uh, uh, on the other on the other end who can help navigate that. Um, most most resorts uh, businesses uh, in other countries have their own customs broker. Um, if not someone specifically assigned and employed to deal with uh, uh, imports. And so te teaming up with them can, can definitely alleviate a lot of stuff, along with having an experienced partner on this side of the border who knows how to, how to work around some stuff. So usually between those two people, they, they can figure out and get it done. Uh, but it varies by country, too. I mean, Mexico, I mean, Caymans, uh, St. Thomas, I mean, I mean, they all, they all have varying degrees of uh, uh, hurdles and, and stuff that they care about and stuff that they don't. I mean, uh, even north of the border, Canada, I mean, getting across the border uh, has its own, own hurdles. Especially now. <clears throat> yes, sir. All right. All right. Let's go to the Cayman Islands hospital job. And we're going to both ask a quick question on that. And then we're going to go to the roundup. We're going to bring John Downing in. Okay. Uh, photos of this one? Uh, no, John. I don't think. Okay. Go ahead, Cliff. Okay. So tell us what happened. Because this is really a unique project, I thought, uh, you know, from was, a restoration standpoint. Yeah, for sure. It was it was even unique in my world. Uh, at the time, I this it, it wasn't something I had dealt with before. Um, but, and, and everybody thinks about Katrina and New Orleans, uh, Hurricane Katrina uh, and, and New Orleans, and, and they forget that uh, the hurricane actually had to go through the, the Caribbean before it, it got there. <laughs> uh, uh, so, so the islands were as uh, decimated as, um, uh, as, as New Orleans was to some degree. I know it didn't strengthen until after that at, at some point, but uh, a lot of damage. So, so we're working on a, a, a help healthcare facility in the Caymans. Well, their, their pits uh, for all their electrical components, their main panels, uh, electrical panels and all that, and all their under, uh, underground uh, cabling and conduit flooded with salt water uh, and from the surge. So, uh, you know, we're, we did the mitigation, dry out and all there, but uh, in a hospital, they were highly concerned about the corrosion from the salt water and, and what it would do to their electrical system. So uh, over, uh, over the course of eight months, we ended up pulling uh, all the electrical cabling underground uh, wire uh, and replacing it. Um, and uh, it, was, it was a slow process. It was, it was um, we had to be very meticulous about scheduling because, uh, 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 you know, surgeries, ICU, um, uh, all, all kinds of all kinds of hurdles and, and curveballs were thrown at us, uh, all while maintaining a minimal amount of uh, uh, stock on the island. So we had to have shipments come in because we couldn't get, uh, you know, well, I guess we could have, but it wouldn't have been smart to get a mass shipment of cable uh, varying sizes and keep it there because I was uh, obviously asking for problems, uh, a, a container, you know, two or three containers full of copper wire uh, would have had a, 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 a target on it for sure. So um, we um, scheduling it out, but we the majority of our runs were uh, probably four all uh, uh, cable or below. But we definitely we got into uh, several two fifties, five hundreds, eight hundred, even a couple of thousand uh, AWG pools. 
And uh, the general process was, you know, with scheduling with the, uh, the hospital and, and what have you, is we would have to uh, 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 unhook it. We'd have to pull the cable out. Then we'd have to swab the uh, conduit, uh, run a rat through, uh, swab it just to pull all the salt water out of the, you know, from the low spots in the, in the conduit and then go back in with the new cable. Um, and it was very slow because obviously, I mean, it's probably worse today, but back then it was, copper was still expensive. And so, uh, uh, you know, going in with the new cable, uh, it was um, uh, the new wire. It was um, very slow and meticulous because you nick that, if you nick that wire, then you're, it's trash. That, that hole runs trash and you're pulling new wire and, and mm. that can get costly. And, and we did a couple of times. Luckily it was small wire. <laughs> a smaller wire, you know, yep. uh, when we did it, but, uh, you know, it, it, it happened. Um, but, um, and that was definitely something new for me as a project manager I hadn't got into. And, uh, we had electricians there, uh, uh journeyman's and masters and, uh, and, and support staff, um, and, uh, uh, you know, teams on both sides, you know, pulling and running and pulling. And, um, it was, it, it, I was there, Eight months, actually. What were you, what were you pulling with? Was it you pulling by hand, or do you have equipment that was pulling? Or yeah, there's a. It's called a. Well, I'm sure there's different manufacturers, but what we had was a Greeley uh, cable puller, and it was basically just a a, a spool low geared uh, motor that basically sat there and pulled. You, you did a wrap on it, or two wraps depending on the size. And then it just, as it comes in one end, it comes out the other and you just keep pulling it out. Um, wow. You know, you, you tie, uh, uh, you start with a, a pull line, uh, just a little kite string, if you will, and then tie a bigger, uh, bigger rope to it. Uh, and, and you're, suck, you're uh, sucking it with a vacuum, uh, high pressure vacuum through to get the line started. And then you're just upgrading and, and pulling one cable after the other. <laughs> Cliff, you want to go to Roundup or you got one more? No, no, Roundup, I think. John, let's go to the Roundup, buddy. The Roundup is brought to you by April Air, providing healthy humidity, ventilation, and air purity solutions for new and existing homes. April Air, healthy air, healthy home at AprilAIRE.com. All right, so we got the roundup. I believe we've got John Donny. Talk about logistical nightmares, Mr. Donny. Uh, <laughs> you're trying to put together a conference in Honolulu, Hawaii. Um, I know it's been postponed at least once. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's twice. Uh, John, do we have you? Yeah, I'm here. Get great here. to have you, buddy. How's things going? It's going great. It's uh, but you are uh, exactly right. Logistical nightmare. Actually, I would. <laughs> Uh, generally caught, describe it as a roller coaster ride, wow. and kind of a nightmare roller coaster ride. So, Do you think uh, you're going to be able to pull this off, John? Uh, yes, what is it, yes. January 18th? First of all, I just want to say to Patrick, I really loved listening to your talk and, and seeing your talk. Uh, the theme for, our conf for this Healthy Buildings Conference is research to practice. You are a prime person for practice to research because the things that you guys have been doing are things that researchers I really think need to know about and 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 kind of ponder how they can support the so, sort of innovative uh, activities you guys do in the restoration world. So Thank back you. to healthy buildings though, Joe. Yes, it's uh, uh, the 18th, 19th and 20th, Tuesday, Wednesday and third, Thursday of January. It has actually, this is the, it was postponed three times. Oh. <laughs> Originally June of 2021, then August of 2021, then November of 2021, and I guess four, four, this is a fourth date, January of 2022. Wow. It cannot go any later than this um, no. because uh, ISIAC has a conference their indoor air conferences in June. So um, we, we, we've uh, obviously we have been determined that we would do this in person and we feel good that it's going to happen. 
the I guess the thing I would say right now, what makes it different, in addition to the fact that uh, in Hawaii, the numbers are extremely low, uh, COVID numbers, uh, as, especially hospitalizations, which is a big deal to them, uh, are extremely low. Uh, but there's still almost, uh, we still have what, 45, 50 days to go. So yeah. things could possibly change. But in Hawaii, they are, you know, really they're, they're struggling uh, because they are a uh, economy based on tourism. So they need to get people there and they're pretty determined uh, at this point to do that. Having said that, if by chance we are, if they pull the rug out from under, under us at the last moment, we are prepared if we must to, to switch to a all virtual conference. Got it. Uh, so I, I don't anticipate it at this point, especially after all we've been through, I really would not welcome it, but we will be prepared for it if we need to. Well, you've got people that come from all over the world with this Omicron uh, variant now. Some of them may have trouble getting there um, as, unless they get their tests in and out. I'm, I'm wondering, Patrick, with respect to COVID um, and the vaccine mandate issue, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to uh, get into the politics of it, but I'm wondering, are you, uh, you have more than 100 employees, I think it is, or whatever. Um, you expecting to have to get all your people vaccinated? Uh, I, I think we're preparing for that. Um, uh, and I know there's still some politics that has to play out. Uh, but um, yes, uh, the size of the company that we're, we're at, I, I think inevitably it, it's uh, something that we should plan around. Do you know if you've been getting much pushback from employees? I know that there has been, absolutely. Uh, yeah. But um, um, at the end of the day, if, if we don't have a choice, we don't have a choice, right? Yep. That's you got to do what you got to do, uh, and you're uh, you're you're definitely big enough that you're going to have to fall under that ETS, the emergency temporary standard situation. It, it's been pushed back, so OSHA's kind of on hold right now. Right. Um, John, what do you think? Uh, are they going to require? the people show vaccination at the conference? So if you are coming from the U.S., you ha you either must um, uh, show vaccinate, prove vaccination status in order to enter Hawaii or uh, have a negative, the appropriate negative COVID test or tests. Uh, although at the convention center, their standard is you must be tested. You're, I'm sorry. You not not you must be tested. You must be vaccinated. So, at the to attend the conference, you will have to be vaccinated. They will not accept uh, the uh, negative tests. They they don't want people to be going. The the process that you have to follow if you uh, go with testing is extremely cumbersome, and they don't really have the staffing right now to. Yeah take care of that. Uh, neither do we uh, with with Iziak and, and Siri and the organizing committee. You mentioned people coming from overseas. Uh, they have their the bar is a little bit higher for them. But it, it seems to me we're uh, there are going to be a fair number of people that are pl still planning to attend in person uh, from Europe. Uh, it seems that Asia, though, is probably not going to come we we had a lot of abstract submissions from uh, Japan in particular, and virtually no one has followed through to register. Mm. So it's our understanding at this point, because we haven't heard from them that, and, and they can get to Hawaii. At this point, the problem for them is going home. They can go home, oh. they, they're mandatory vet, um, quarantine for, I think 15 days when they go home. Wow. My, my feeling is that the people, we had an extraordinary um, um, response for this conference from people in Japan. So I, th I know that they're very interested, but I think they're waiting to see if something changes and if something does, they'll move. But at this point, that's not an option. And that makes it difficult for us because we're trying to plan and schedule this conference. 
uh, that's been one of our biggest uh, challenges is with so many things changing and, and, and uh, timelines, uh, it's really difficult to, to um, uh, schedule things. But we're going to do it. We're in, the, we're in the process. We are working long hours. Hey, Go ahead. Uh, Jeff, I'm sorry. No, if I may, uh, I think it was probably last month I attended a, a dinner in New York City. And it was a very large dinner, uh, 3,500 people. And it would have been bigger than that, but they kind of discouraged international people from coming. So what was required, number one, is everyone had to be vaccinated. Number two, everyone had to be tested before they went. And they did this testing uh, in New York City. I mean, it was, it was unbelievable. They actually you know, rented this basement. They had... Uh, you know, they, they took your name and, and, and all this testing, if I'm not mistaken, was all PCR testing. And they had the results back in about 30 minutes. So yeah. it can be done, buddy. It's just, you know, <laughs> you, you got to know the right people. And, you know, if, if you need some information on that, I can try to put you in touch with that organization if you think it would help you. Yeah, I can, on the restoration side too, we've been looking into that as well because, you know, running 200, 300, 400 labor, uh, some of our clients are requiring it. So, uh, you know, th there's definitely services out there that offer that. Mm -hmm. And you charge for that. I mean, yeah, if you have to, you do it, you've got to charge for it. Okay. All right. Well, John, we're going to have you back on December 17th with Terry yeah. Brennan, one of the keynotes at the conference. So uh, thanks for joining us today. And before we go, Patrick, I want to make sure we give you the last word. Is there anything we missed that you'd like to add or uh, just anything at all? No, not at all. Uh, I, I just uh, uh, appreciate uh, being invited. And uh, uh, Cliff, uh, you know, good seeing you again. Been many years. Uh, but um, uh, I appreciate it. And uh, if there's anything that, that First On Site can help out with, anybody out there in the, in the virtual world, uh, reach out to us. Very good. Well, this is Radio Joe Hughes saying thanks to John Downey and, of course, to Mr. Patrick McCarty. I'm glad to have gotten to meet you and get a chance to talk to you. Uh, my co-host, the Z-Man, Cliff Zlotnick. John, you got to have faith at the controls. Most importantly, our growing group of uh, our audience. And um, next week, we've got an interesting show. we got Franco Seif. Um, Joe Spurgeon, and I'll be darned, but I can't remember the third name. We're going to be talking about testing fire residues. So this is another kind of restoration-related project. Looking forward to it. We'll be back next Friday with the next episode of IAQ Radio Plus. For IAQ Radio, I'm Spike Real saying thanks for listening.